Well, hello and welcome. It's another Confessions podcast. I hope you've been waiting for the latest and the freshest collection of terrible tales from the Radio 2 listeners. They've been up to no good, as normal. Uh, This week's concise collection features a devious disc jockey, a silly science teacher, a troop of sneaky scouts, and a very topical Commonwealth Games confession. It's another drive time confession, and it comes from uh, Smashy. Oh. Dear Simon and the Condemnatory Cluster. Yep. Like that one. Another alliteration. Very good. I write in order to seek forgiveness for sins which date back to the late 90s. Being a cocky young lad, I managed to talk my way into a job at the local radio station. You know the type of place where the competition prizes were knitted. (laughs) I'm sure that... No, I do know the places. Yes, yes. After, I've worked for most of them. After two years of pushing various buttons, answering phones and generally being the office gopher for little or no reward, yep. I was given my chance. My one chance to become the greatest radio DJ there ever was. Oh. My on-air persona was to be that of the Saturday night Dr. Love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, outstanding. Sometime, I'm already forgiven. Sometime, already forgiven. Oh, whatever well it is. done. Sometimes Dr. referred Dr. to on air as Dr. Kiss Kiss. Oh. Anyway, now this is where the story starts to get a bit dark. Anyone who's ever worked in radio will shudder when I mention this dreaded five letter word Rajar. Oh. Even writing it now, 15 years later, brings me out in a cold sweat. For the uninitiated, these are the quarterly audience figures by which any radio station judges its success. A yardstick that, as far as I could make out, was based partly on blind luck and partly on black magic. Which is, I think, actually about right. I think it's quite accurate. Yeah, well, you, where I was, you were banned from taking leave or holiday during that period. That's you couldn't right. go away. You had to stay where you were. Work! Okay. <laughs> Work. OK, and other anecdotes as we go <laughs> through the story. If anybody's got it. Now, says Smashy, my audience was made up almost entirely of three distinct demographics. Taxi drivers, prisoners and prisoners' wives. <laughs> That is so accurate. The eagle-eared amongst the collective will have noticed that one of the three demographics is unlikely to be regularly questioned by the good people at Rajar, making my actual audience a third larger than the so-called figures published. I knew that they were there as I'd spent hours every week trying to rewrite dozens of letters, removing any references to bars, walls or cells in the, in the hope that my minuscule, non prisony audience would think these were letters from long-distance truckers or soldiers, maybe. In the event, it was a third that I could well have done with because my numbers were falling faster than you could say, that's Minnie Ripperton and loving you. <laughs> in, in hindsight, there were many things I could have done to boost my flagging little show. Playing the songs that people wanted would have been one of them. Because actually I had a band list on which Tina Turner and Krista Berg featured quite heavily. Or I could have given actual love advice, like the previous incumbent had. But I was 20 years old and barely being kissed. What did I know about life with a convicted armed robber? (laughs) (laughs) I, I I I needed to boost my image around the station and quickly. In the end, I sought guidance from Tom. Yes, Tom Jones. As you are no doubt aware, the Welsh Lothario's numerous adoring fans like to display their affection via the medium of underwear. If it works for Tom, it's going to work for me. Thought my Rajar befuddled brain. A quick rummage through my girlfriend's drawers and... A oh, pa- a what? Pad- a padded Has this en- been checked? A padded envelope <laughs> from the stationery cupboard and I was set. Two days later, I feigned modesty as I made a special day tri- daytime trip to the office where I unveiled my frilly present to my frankly bemused office. Look what I'm getting, I said as I held up a pair of lacy knickers with hearts on. Wow, the power of my radio show, huh? I waved the underwear in the air. Far from office adulation, all I got was a non-plus newsroom, which is fairly standard. Twisty faces in the traffic department and disbelief in marketing. (laughs) What? What was that in the traffic department? Twisty faces. Oh, right, Okay. Okay. (laughs) Move on. I tried this. <laughs> I tried this a few times without impressing anyone, surprisingly. <laughs> but now time was running out, uh, and I was running out of my girlfriend's pants, and I wasn't going to start buying new ones. I wasn't that desperate. I think you were. <laughs> Suffice to say, my broadcasting career didn't last long. Oh. I was unceremoniously ejected from the love seat the moment a similarly cocky young lad came along willing to give up their Saturday nights for a pittance. So therefore, I have to apologise to all my radio colleagues who I misled into believing that I was more popular than I actually was by saying that I'd been sent pants. To my now wife for stealing her favourite undies and to the people of this particular area that I broadcast for denying them the songs that they really wanted to hear because of my musical snobbery. If they wanted to... Tina Turner or Christopher Berg, they couldn't have it. I 
hope they can, you can find it in your hearts to forgive a fellow broadcaster, albeit a rubbishy one, <laughs> yours pleadingly, uh, and that's from uh, Smashy. I'm sure it's got a few jingles and a few stories to tell. Anyway, that's very good. We haven't had a Rage Our Base story. We like that one very much. What do you think? I don't Rage really understand what he was trying to achieve with the pants because it wasn't going to affect the Rage Our figures. I because he's he trying was... to impress his bosses, I know, but really. for what? I mean, if all he was worried about was the audience figures, then uh, the pants weren't going to do that. So I think it was a bit desperate. And yes. uh, also yes. the fact that he was a musical <laughs> snob, very bad. Not yes. thinking of his audience, no. not thinking of the listeners. Unforgivable in radio. So you're not forgiven. Oh, very good. And very stern. Here's the dean. Uh, yes, uh, on the subject of snobby listeners, you have to play what they want. <laughs> That's the part of the job, really. Um, as for the uh, as for the underwear uh, of the wife, she must have had more than one pair, surely. So I don't think she was too worried about that. A missing pair of uh, of undies, and the colleagues they probably weren't bothered anyway, to be honest. Yes. Uh, it does okay. raise the question: there is a there is actually a cupboard in this building which is full of padded envelopes. I thought you were about to say something. And else. now what? I know what they're there for. <laughs> yes. Ah. That's true. I'll well, tell you where it is, Matt, later. <laughs> Pop down okay. and you can tell us what's going on. So, um, so um, <laughs> Brother Matthew. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to forgive, are you, Dudley? I'm going to forgive, yeah. Good for you. Um, you're not. I, I mean, we've all been desperate at some time in our lives. I think we've all <laughs> really <laughs> resorted to bringing in our partner's underwear and flinging well, it around a, the it, office. It's a kind of a. It's the Tom Jones tactic. You know, it, look how if, popular I am. Yes, here. I am supposed it, it, yeah, to be pretending that he's. But again, so as, as, as we've pointed out, that's had no effect on, on the rage. But it, it is a sign of desperation. And for that, who of us can toss the stones in the, in the glass house what? that we've never been desperate with? <laughs> what we've was all that meant to be? Desperate. We've all. We've We've all, we may not have brought in our partner's underwear, no. but we've probably come close. So I am going to say <laughs> forgiven, because which of us wouldn't do the same? Toss wow. the stones in the toss, glass tossing house. Glass That's Confucius. Tossing, tossing the stones in the glass houses with the, with the partner's is. underwear. That's a Confucius yes, thing. Yes, very much so. Confucius, he said. Yes, certainly yeah, confusing definitely thing. Definitely forgiven. Yeah. All right, OK, yeah, so uh, I think, what you think if there are any other rage are or, you know, Radio confessions will yes. will take them. They'd be good. I suppose there's not much point in asking for prison-based confessions. No. <laughs> Why? Well, they've got. To, they might be out now. Already <laughs> doing time. Oh, not really. BBC Radio 2. Sister Rebecca is passing notes to the Dean. Not quite sure what's going on there. I'm just asking chicken. why the Apprentice music played during that trail. <laughs> oh, my goodness me. <laughs> that <laughs> is ridiculous. <laughs> the, the Dean, the dean has fallen off his stool. <laughs> He's fallen off his stool here, ladies and gentlemen. I do apologise. Well, don't, don't sit on the spike, Alan. It's, <laughs> well, it's very little to sit on, to be honest. <laughs> Someone's sending you a message there, I think. Yeah. Well, I think it's all part of, you know, we're trying not to overspend here at the Sally, BBC. Sally broke that yesterday. Oh, really? Oh, now you tell me. I am meant to pass that on. He's <laughs> got the comedy chair. Anyway, here we go. This is Simon in Coventry who sent in tonight's confession. Thank you, Simon in Coventry. Dear Simon, in the Drive Time Collective, as a science technician at a high school, I am often asked, come the end of term, for fun experiments to entertain the flagging kids and keep them interested until the bitter end. <laughs> or holidays, as everyone else calls it. Now, this seems to be particularly appropriate. I think most schools are finished by Friday. A lot of schools breaking up tomorrow. So here's a science end of term confession. One in particular reminds me of my own schoolboy transgression. I was always good at science and never followed the norm when it came to practicals, often finishing them before anyone else and asking for more complicated things to do. I think you're a SWAT. Simon. <laughs> this led me to be unusually friendly with the technician, as I would be left with her to do the more complex things while the rest caught up. Steady. <laughs> this particular prank, of which I humbly ask for forgiveness, was committed when we were asked to, to fulfil. You've read it before, a... haven't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you'd be surprised, Bear. We were asked to do a new project, which was to make a volcano. What? Always very... To make a volcano. In the, one uh, of those erupting things. Wow. The brief was simple. It had to be bench-top size, it had to have labels, and, of course, it must have a lava effect. Indeed, sir, specifically used the word exploding, as I remember anyway, says Simon, <laughs> in Coventry. Yes. My mind was immediately away. Vinegar and baking powder was the obvious choice, but way too small. How about thermite? And this was quite attractive, as thermite is used in metal refining and welding and sometimes in fireworks. But, hey, as you know, 3CuO plus 2Al it leads to 3Cu plus Al2O3. Absolutely. Mm. And that Absolutely. could get nasty. Ooh. 
and I didn't think burning a hole through the floor with molten copper would be a good idea. <laughs> I mean, on balance, I think that's, that's yeah, probably right. And then it hit me, the perfect balance. I immediately got to work. I built the structure around a conical flask lent to me by the technician, and then asked her for the lava. She thought it was a great idea, but warned me not to use too much. Mm -hmm. So the day came. All others were simple affairs. Pathetic, really. Papier-mâché, cardboard, bit of vinegar, bit of baking powder, bit of food colouring. Feeble and predictable. And then it was my turn. In my conical flask was hydrogen peroxide and dish soap. In the beaker I was holding was a saturated solution of a mystery fluid, which I'm not prepared to mention here in case your health oh. and safety folk are in any way worried. I was about to unleash the chemical reaction known as the elephant's toothpaste. Now, Matt and, oh, I, Matt yes. and I have done yes. this. Yeah. Uh, okay, more on that in just a moment. Anyway, this is a well-known and perfectly safe experiment. Much beloved of teachers and science fans everywhere, particularly at the end of term. I poured in the liquid, did it what I needed to do, and then dived under the bench. Technically, this is where the hydrogen peroxide decomposes into water and oxygen gas. But practically, from my hiding place, I heard a whoa, and then, ga <laughs> and then gasps, followed by quite a few screams. Oh. I emerged to find half the bench, the floor, the students and the teachers covered in yellow-tinged and slightly steaming foam. No. I had done way, way too much. I had got the proportions slightly wrong. So therefore, as you may well gather, I need a lot of forgiveness, but not from my classmates who thought it was brilliant, nor from the teacher who gave me full marks. Not even from the technician, who, although got a sound telling off, said it was the best thing she'd seen in years, but from the cleaners, who had the horrible job of cleaning mystery fluid stains from the bench, floor and walls. It took two cleaners the best part of two days to manage the job. I beg forgiveness. Yours humbly, Simon Country. Now, a few years ago, Matt and I filmed this uh, yes, along with... UCL, a... wasn't it? Yes. Why, why, why were you filming Well, we had a confession... Yeah. Uh, which is all about a screaming jelly baby, which is a well-known scientific course, uh, yeah. experiment. So following on the back of that, we went and recreated this uh, with Dr. Jonathan Speed. Uh, here's a little bit. In fact, we've done a link. For, if you go to our Facebook page, you can, see the, you, can see the, you can see the whole elephant's toothpaste thing, as far as the audio is concerned. So the last one is called the elephant's toothpaste. Here's Dr. We're going to put a little bit of our bioreagent that I've, I've woken up into this tube, a little bit of the, uh, the soap powder, nice and gloopy, yes. and then give that a bit of a mix... And then we just have to add... And is this a mystery agent as well? This is a mystery agent. Okay, well, yes. Lots of mystery. So we'll mix these two together, and we should get a breakdown nice and quickly. And that's wow. why we call it toothpaste. And it erupts, and it comes straight out of the tube in a rather spectacular yeah. wow. fashion. Uh, and if you want to see that, go to our Facebook page. So you can actually see the experiment that our confession was based on. That's how thrilling this is. Simon in Coventry, however, would like the forgiveness, please, uh, because he did mess it up as far as the cleaners were concerned. Thermite, by the way, is a pretty terrifying reaction, and as I recall, is unstoppable. You can't actually put it out. So he was wise not to go for thermite. Wow. <laughs> uh, anyway, what do you think, Sister Rebecca? Well, I think hydrogen peroxide all over a bunch of people. It's not really laughing matter, is it? I mean, it, it oh, definitely bleaches things. I know that from my youth, bleaching my hair with it. But what about if it gets no, in your eyes? Because... They didn't complain. They didn't complain. No. If, you, if you were listening, right. technically this is where the there hydrogen peroxide decomposes, uh, decomposes. into so water. So no longer dangerous. Into water and okay. oxygen gas. All right, fair enough. But the okay, my oxide and the hydrogen my real gripe is yes. that this is a chemistry teacher, right? So it's yes. his job, as Matt would say. No, he was a pupil. He was a pupil at the time. He is pupil. now a science technician, but he was a pupil okay, at the time. Okay, so he... Put, no. He, uh, <laughs> Spirit of he was a, a pupil who was allowed to uh, do experiments. So surely that one experiment can't be that difficult to get the proportions right for this um, fun experiment, as yes. he was calling it. So I just think for that reason, and that reason alone, I'm not going to forgive. Okay, it's harsh words. Here's the Dean. I'm going to forgive because yes. it was mistake. The proportions were wrong. That was all. And every Everyone was impressed, everyone enjoyed it, and as Matt will tell you, it's the cleaner's job to clean. <laughs> How? Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> right. Matt's, Matt's looking so right. Here's the thing, right? And the, uh, obviously, thing. obviously, you know, it's end of term, so I, I've got no problem with him doing the experiment in the first place and getting the proportions wrong, that's fine. I do have a big problem with him saying, oh, and then the cleaners clean everything up. Cleaners aren't there to, cleaners are there just to make things a bit cleaner. They're not there to clean up clean. massive chemical waste from your experiment that's gone wrong because you. You got the proportions wrong, so I am not going to forgive because it's not the cleaner's job. Two days they spent on that. Absolutely ridiculous. If I had been one of those cleaners, I would have kicked off in a big way. Maybe they did. No way am 
am I cleaning that up and spending two days of my time on your experiment gone wrong? No, uh, definitely not forgiven. It's, a, it's another drive time confession. It's a Commonwealth Games story. And that I, while I was reading this, I did remember many years ago getting a Commonwealth Games confession from the Northern Ireland team. All of them? It was from a whole bunch of uh, women athletes in the Northern Ireland team who, as part of the opening ceremony, had yes. decided deliberately not to wear something that they should have worn. And that was essentially the, uh, the confession. Oh. Anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. No, I don't remember that one. I want the no. getting through the lawyers. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh. No, that was fine. This is many, many years. This is many, many years. Oh, ago, really? Right? Oh, yes. right. when you different was... times. Different times. <laughs> yes. Uh, I believe oh, the expression right. is. That's right. Yeah. Different times. You can forgive anything. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So uh, this is from Michael, uh, who says, "Dear friends, my confession goes back quite a long way. Yep. As we start to celebrate the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, I feel that it's about time I admitted to a rather unfortunate set of circumstances, which I committed during the last time the Commonwealth Games were in Scotland in 1986." At that time, I was a serving police officer and was selected to provide royalty protection for Her Majesty the Queen and other members of the royal family when they visited the game. So instantly, I think... This is already great. This is a, yeah. this is a good yeah. start. The highlight for all of the officers involved in providing protection came on the last day of the games when we were informed that six of us would be running alongside the royal carriage <laughs> carrying Her Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh, to all intents and purposes, to prevent the excited and jubilant athletes from approaching and trying to jump on board the carriage. <laughs> I'm not sure that they would do that, but anyway. As the day and the event approached, our superiors suddenly realised that six strapping officers would look rather conspicuous running alongside the carriage in normal work clothes, usually a well-pressed suit, collar, tie and well-polished shoes. One of our superiors then had a brainwave, this, which they could have thought of earlier. The escorting officers should dress like athletes no. and wear Scotland tracksuits. This is a great idea, but where would we get these garments at such short notice? Aha, they thought, well, we'll approach the organisers. They'll surely have some spare sets, said our glorious leader. But sadly, no spare gear was available. Then one of the Commonwealth Games officials had a great idea. We could approach Scottish athletes and ask to borrow a tracksuit or two. It's, it's all very sort of make it up as you go along. We all became somewhat excited at the prospect of wearing a Scotland tracksuit at the closing ceremony of the Commonwealth Games. Then the tracksuits arrived, and as a relatively junior officer, I got the last one, which had been given previously to Yvonne Murray, a Scottish medal winner. It fitted just, said Michael, though a woman's tracksuit... I have to say, isn't my favourite garment. But nonetheless, we're all now looking, to all intents and purposes, like Scottish team members, even if some of the male officers were wearing women's clothing. <laughs> I won't read that bit. As the time... <laughs> oh, you can't leave it like that. As the time approached for us to join Her Majesty, we were all positioned together at the side of the track in front of the main stand. You could feel the excitement building as the final events took place. Then I suddenly felt a tap on my shoulder. <laughs> I turned around to see a young lad with an autograph book standing right next to me. Can I have your autograph, please? This is my, uh, my yeah, this general is, yeah, accent. Does, yes. yeah, Come on, yeah, mister. Go on. Can I have your autograph, please? He said with wide open eyes. <laughs> what could I do? Say that I was impersonating Yvonne Murray? I might be wearing her clothes, but I was clearly a strapping Glaswegian copper. Uh, no, I took the book from the young lad and I signed it with an indecipherable scrawl as I turned around to hand it back to him he said what did you do and did you win a medal well I didn't know what to say but my colleagues uh, were all sniggering and holding back their snorts of laughter at this point um I said I was in the badminton came forth <laughs> well thanks <laughs> thanks to the young lad fourth in the badminton yeah, he trotted off back to his parents to show them the signature of some guy who hadn't won anything in the badminton <laughs> Thinking I'd done well and not hurt anyone's feelings, I turned back to watch the last few events. However, only a few seconds later, I was again tapped on the shoulder. On turning round, I froze. There on the steps were about 25 to 30 young kids, <laughs> all with autograph books, all wanting to get my autograph. I signed all of them, smiling throughout. I wrote, love one another, in the scroll. <laughs> Keep true to your own desires. Oh, Stay in school, kids. 
I'd like to teach the world to sing. That was my favourite one. Anyway, I smiled until the last one was left. As the Commonwealth Games returns to Scotland, I imagine there are a number of mums and dads who'll be bringing out their old autograph books and showing them to their kids, telling them about the time they encountered this great heaving Scottish badminton player at the Edinburgh, Edinburgh Commonwealth Games who came forth, but who kindly took time to sign their books. I'm about to travel to Glasgow to be a technical official at the Games. At least this time I'll be wearing my own clothes. But I'm certain there'll be no requests for autographs. But I do ask for forgiveness for deliberately deceiving those innocent, poor, wide-eyed youngsters all those years ago. Michael, thank you very much indeed. A Commonwealth Games tale. Very good. You can understand his conundrum, really. He didn't want to disappoint, and he had a Scottish athlete's uh, tracksuit on. What Even though think? it was a woman's tracksuit. I love he the was. idea of the strapping <laughs> glass region officer in a woman's Where tracksuit. Is Yvonne Murray's tracksuit. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think uh, he was thinking on his feet, and uh, he he's obviously got a sense of humour because he was writing all those funny messages. And as you said, he didn't want to disappoint all the youngsters. Uh, I mean, most uh, autographs are scrawls anyway. You can't even read who, who they are, and most people would have forgotten even if he genuinely was. Do you think? The fourth yeah. place badminton player. So no harm was done. I think, uh, yeah, it was fine. You're forgiven. Here's the Dean then. Yeah, I agree with that. No harm done. It's a little bit of fun, really. And uh, the alternative was to spend lots of time trying to explain what he was doing. He was on duty. He'd got things to do. He was a busy man. He had Her Majesty to protect. Absolutely. Is there a more noble cause? No, there isn't. We forgive. OK, very good. Now here's Matt. <laughs> yes. That, um, oh, excuse me. Sorry, I, mean, <laughs> I just know what he's going to say. You know Ma- gonna... yeah. Yes, um, uh, no problem with the mistaken identity. However, this this security detail feels a bit on the hoof. <laughs> bit, uh, I know what we'll do. Don't put your suits on. We'll go dressed as athletes. Have we got any... No, we haven't got any. Right, well, let's just borrow some from the athlete. What? It's we just... No, you're supposed to be conspicuous. You're the security detail. Otherwise, people are just going to... Why are those athletes running alongside the Queen? Um, so I am going to forgive, oh. but I'm not going to forgive the people who organised the security detail. It's their fault. <laughs> um, but uh, Michael definitely does get forgiven. Yeah. Here comes uh, final confession for a couple of weeks' time, then uh, then back uh, when we're back on the, from holes. Uh, now, there are a couple of accents that I need to... Uh, Outstanding. Where in, the, where in the world are we going to be? Well, they're... Cornwall? No, they Again? <laughs> well... <laughs> It's it's job related, really, rather than part of the country. So it's okay. acting then. It's acting. It's so acting. heads of department. So there's a vicar. Yeah. There's a vicar and a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. I can't wait for the farmer. Yeah, okay. farmer. The vicar doesn't really have an accent. Does well, oh, it does if it's yeah, old school C of E. Uh, Derek yeah. Nimmo. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly right. Or Gas and Mayo. So uh, sitcom vicar and sitcom farmer. Well. Okay. Who's this from? It's from Nobby. I uh, no Noddy. Beg your pardon. <laughs> Thank you, Noddy. Nobby, Noddy. Uh, dear Father Simon the Collector, my confession dates back to my school days is where I get to feel a little uncomfortable. The school in Solihull better remain nameless, not for my sake, but as a certain Radio 2 DJ was in my form at the time. Ah. Oh. Is this... So, this Uh, could be you? (laughs) Well, it's either going to be me or Johnny Walker. Okay. Because we both went to the same school, but not at the same time. No. And he was expelled. Really? Yeah. For being too bright. That's the one. (laughs) That's why. (laughs) My school... (laughs) Simon wasn't. Had its own scout troop with a scout hut. I could tell you a few things about the scout hut. Don't. And importantly, an annual scout camp. As a slightly overweight member of Kestrel Patrol, it was with very mixed feelings that I headed north to the Yorkshire village of Masham for the summer camp, and the competition for more badges was on. I'd already failed at the swimming badge, as I was so buoyant. I'd failed to get under the water to do the rubber brick trick. So it was with you. Know, do you do that? Did you ever do the thing? You have to retrieve the brick from the bottom of the uh, bottom of the swimming pool. Yeah, you, you have to do it in your pajamas, don't you? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Only that. you, actually, Matt. We're not going to do that. I did my had a wetsuit, aqualung. <laughs> so it was with trepidation I boarded the minibus to Mashon. The first few days were relatively uneventful. We nearly poisoned our uh, our tent by trying to cook chicken in an earth oven, burnt on the outside but raw and bleeding under the skin. Mm. How about that? I kept that one. <laughs> Bless you, Nigel. <laughs> Was that a reaction to a horrendous dish? Didn't sound great, did That's it? That's kind of dangerous, isn't it? To Burnt on the it... outside and raw under the skin. You wouldn't want to serve that. No, and I hope we didn't cook it in the, the tent either. Anyway, no cooking badge for us, says Noddy. After a few nights of Gingangooli, my nightmare was upon me. It's the opportunity to win the recognition of the orienteering badge. A sunny Saturday morning and the prospect of a ten-mile hike to a grid reference. I couldn't work out if the map was the right way up. That's how good I was. Thankfully, my hiking partner reckoned he could work it out, so off we said. Camp was in the grounds of a country hall at the end of a mile-long drive. As we made our way up this long and winding path, after about a hundred yards, a car horn sounded. It was the local vicar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello. 
he rammed down his car window and he said the magic words, Hello, boys, would you like a lift to the dr- end of the drive? I'm heading that way. OK. That's how they all, <laughs> yeah. all used to talk yeah. in the 70s. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know how the old saying, never look a gift vicar in the mouth. So anyway, we hopped in. Our hike was underway in some comfort, I might add. He had a very nice car. As we got out of the car, we thanked the vicar and began our journey proper. We walked hastily just over the road to the local farm. Now, this seemed the ideal opportunity to test our map reading skills with the farmer, who was very busy in the farmyard. By this point, we'd walked a full 200 yards. So with determination in our eyes and with enthusiasm in our voice, we asked the farmer, excuse me, have you got any idea of the right road to cover him? Okay, that's as in Coverham, right? That's anyway, because uh, we think we've uh, we think we've read this map right, but we're not quite sure. Acting skills required here, Father Simon. Well, hang on a minute. <laughs> Just go for it. Said go the farmer, on. Yorkshire, around there, you know, up top now. Cover them. I'm going there myself, so. <laughs> <I'll cover. laughs> Spotty breathe now. Go on, go on. <laughs> well, we had a farmer on yesterday. He didn't say anything like this. I could just carry on doing all the voice. No, you've got to do it in that voice. Oh, okay. oh my god! Okay, hang on a minute. I'm going there. My f- <laughs> going there myself. So hop on the back of the tractor. I'll give you a lift. So I will. Anyway, the- <laughs> well, this was looking like our lucky day. Says Noddy. Really? We hopped on the back and we set off. Twenty minutes later, we were actually there. We even got apple juice and biscuits. Now we had to find answers to a few local questions. Uh, to prove that we'd actually got to the right place. All pretty simple stuff, especially when you ask the local news agent for the answers. Anyway, then came the tricky bit. How long do we hang around before we set out for the return journey so that it looks like a realistic hike in terms of time out of camp? Well, we found the sweet shop because we were well too young for the pub and we sat down in a field to watch the world go by, accompanied by aniseed balls, pear drops and a quarter of licorice all sorts. After a couple of hours... We reckoned we'd eaten enough and it was time to head back to the camp. We were chuffed to bits that our hiking challenge had been cut in half. Anyway, ten minutes into our long return journey, we heard a beep of a horn. Not the car horn, it wasn't the vicar, but the tractor horn and our favourite farmer was back. Hop on, lads, (laughs) was his cheerful call. (laughs) Well, clearly, no, this was... Far too much. We were pushing our luck to accept another lift. This would be outrageous. So reluctantly, we replied, oh, go on then. So uh, we hopped on and we had a fantastic lift. So almost home, we just had to drive back to base camp to test our less than athletic frames. And the orienteering badge was in the bag. But obviously, we had cheated. And so therefore, the forgiveness, please, not for my fellow scouts, who are far too badged up already. But I do seek the forgiveness of the scouting movement worldwide for winning my badge under false pretenses. Forty years on, I beg the forgiveness of Father Simon and the Collective, but particularly you, nameless Radio 2 DJ, for tainting the reputation of your old school. Bless you all in optimistic expectation. Lots of love. Noddy. Dib, dib, dib. That's how he sounds it. Well, um, I don't think you can cheat getting a badge. I'm not sure that that's acceptable. Even though, you know, you're offered a lift from the vicar and the farmer, it's kind of tempting. I don't know. What do you think, sister? Well, I Becca? think that was priceless for your uh, accents you. alone. You the much. Welsh farmer veering into the West w- Country. And well, back. I was trying to be regionally sensitive. <laughs> and right. not, and not, I was trying uh, to offend well everybody, yeah. rather well than just one particular region. I think that, uh, in a way, it was the organisers' fault because there was no. They didn't check to see whether they anyone had done this thing properly. I mean, they must have. They could have got them to pick up something at the, you know, on the way or at their destination and bring it back. So I kind of blame them. And I also think if you're offered a lift by a vicar and a farmer, it'd be rude to say no, wouldn't it? So I'm going to forgive. Oh, OK. Well, that's very nice. There'll be a few uh, people who've been to this school who'll go... Uh, yes. Scout hut. I remember, yes. I remember that. And it'll make them feel very guilty. Anyway, what do you have here, novice? Well, I think they should maybe get an initiative prize, really, because the fact they were actually offered it, they didn't go and tout for business, the vicar and the farmer, en route back to Devon. Um, they're all that way. And what a long drive with a trailer full of cattle. Um, rather than Massam. Yes. And, and also, guilty secrets, they were loaded up with licorice all sorts, which I love. 
uh, and quite partial to Kestrel in my day. So well done to them, no, Noddy. Kest- Kestrel Patrol was the name yeah. of the... Sk- was oh, they cider. Oh, was it? They weren't drinking. <laughs> oh, sorry, that was just me then. <laughs> when he oh. says an overweight member of Kestrel Patrol, he wasn't <laughs> overweight because he'd been drinking. Oh. It was just they were named after the bird. It's amazing where your, main, your, 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 your mind uh, races to, anyway. But it, it must have been the accents that threw me, anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. But I know that part of the world is fantastic. And uh, basically, you know, when the weather changes, you could have been in trouble on the moors. So I think it was a safe bet going on the tractor. Uh, so Noddy uh, and your mate, uh, well, yeah, absolutely uh, forgive them. OK, let's see how... Uh, this uh, this definitely uh, falls into the category of which of us would not do the same if we were in the same position. Because if you're offered a lift by, as we say, sitcom vicars or farmer <laughs> from somewhere between Abergavenny and Taunton, then you're obviously going to say yes. So we'd all have done it. Uh, so I'm definitely going to forgive Well, they were this week's confessions. Not bad, I think. If it prompted a thought, if it made you feel guilty, and if you'd like to tell me your tale, confessions at bbc.co.uk. We're back in the middle of August after the holes, and the weekly mayo is available to download now and every Friday. Thank you very much.